You guys look like you're waiting for something. All right, well, you came to the right place because uh, we're doing something very special every day, once a day, here at 2.30. And that is uh, what we're gonna talk about now. Uh, I'm up here with our good friend from the Bob Moog Foundation, Michelle Mokusa. Would you welcome her? Bob Moog's daughter. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about uh, something really special that we're doing uh, with the Bob Moog Foundation. And you're probably curious what this is. I'm going to show you what that is at the end of this because it's linked to all, to all of this. And um, so first, we want to talk about uh, what Bob Moog, uh, what, he, what he left us. And um, so for me, it started when I was, I was a little kid. And I walked into, uh, it was the, the, the first and only guitar center in San Francisco. It was a little teeny store. And they had a mini Moog in there. And I played, that was the first time I've ever played a synth, and I played that mini Moog, and it, it changed my life. I was like, that, that is what I want to do. That's incredible. I got to figure this out. And, uh, and there's something, there's a, a magic there in uh, what he created. And uh, as, as, as most of you know, that's the design of and what that instrument is, is still an incredible, incredible thing. And um, so that really, that started my whole journey into electronic music and and um, so uh, Bob was always you know a hero to me and I would see him sometimes as I started getting to to you know trade shows and stuff and and uh, I remember the first time I got I got um, had a phone message from from Bob and and it was like oh, this is Bob Bo I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about the D50 and, and uh, you know I was like I was like, I call, I called everybody. This is this. I got it. Bob Moog's on my answering machine. <laughs> so it's like it was just you know. So he's really a, a, a hero to uh, to all of us. And um, so the Bob Moog Foundation is carrying on his legacy and doing some really cool things. So I want you guys to hear about what uh, they're up to because it's something we really believe in. So tell us a little bit about the Bob Moog Foundation. I'd be glad to. Um, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to the creativity that that the mini moog sparked in you, and it's that very kind of ignition, igniting creativity that we're trying to carry on in the foundation, and we're doing that at this beautiful intersection of science, music, history, and innovation. And the way we're doing that is we've got three things going on. One is what we call our Moog Lab. We're bringing electronic musical instruments into the schools to teach kids science behind electronic music. The Moog instruments um, provide this very intuitive, engaging interface, and the kids really enjoy getting connected to all the, the science and the unlimited sound possibilities. The other thing we're doing is we're protecting and preserving Bob's extensive archives, which were in a state of peril when we found them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, I think. And uh, those two things, both our educational goal and our historic preservation, will lead into um, our Hallmark project, which is the future museum to be created in Asheville, North Carolina. Very, very cool. Uh, a lot of people, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it's awesome stuff. It's, we really believe in it uh, because you know, it's a, you know, it, you don't know who you are until you know where you came from, right? And so it's very important that uh, we're now at a point. Electronic music is old enough to start. Okay, it's time to have a history. It's time to preserve uh, how this stuff started. So, for those people that are starting with the iPad. Uh, that they know, <laughs> they know where this stuff came from. It didn't just, you know, materialize out of nothing. So, uh, so it's very exciting what what, uh, what they're doing. And um, so, uh, what should we talk about next? Let's talk about. Uh, Do you want to talk? We talked a little yesterday about what's in the archives and why they're oh, so yeah. important. Oh yeah, yeah. This is some amazing stuff. They they had a, uh, an exhibit down at the. Um, uh, museum up yeah, the museum. And some of these pictures are actually from our visit down at down at the Nam uh, Museum in Carlsbad, and so our team went down there. I mean, look at this. This is like, you know, clockwork orange tapes. Okay, this is like some serious stuff, and uh, prototypes of uh, you know synths and designs. This is the very first Moog prototype that was sent to Herb Deutsch in 1964. Yeah, it's 
incredible. I mean, they had like, you know, original the original eight track tape machines. You know, it's like it's like as big as the booth practically. You know? And um, so it's it's uh, it's it's really exciting. You know, what, what what's in this and, and all the history that's behind it. Um, it, it. There's all kinds of things you're discovering all the time too, right? Yeah, I mean, the, there are so many mediums in the archive. You know, Bob was a very humble man. But he sure did save a lot of um, material, <laughs> and I I doubt whether he had intentionally in mind for a museum to come out of it. But I think what he really understood is he was a historian himself. He really appreciated the history that came before him, and lectured about it frequently. Um, that all this stuff was was very important to save because of the story and understanding that it lends. And um, so we have a lot of different materials, and I had to make a whole list here today because it felt like yesterday I left some stuff out. We have prototypes, schematics, tons of project notes, um, over a thousand photos, uh, uh, articles written by and about Bob, desktop notebooks. These are notebooks that he would keep by his phone and keep a record of what he was talking about. And sometimes it was just an, an airplane flight for where he was going to give a lecture. And sometimes it's a circuit drawing for a module that Wendy Carlos wanted. And everything in between. I mean, the notes about his work with Beaver and Krause, with Herb Deutsch, with the Rolling Stones. It's great, great stuff and a real treasure trove. I really consider those desktop notebooks to be a treasure trove of the archives themselves. There are also um, a whole bevy of vintage catalogs, uh, memorabilia, and a lot of correspondence. So it's really a, a historical collection that's, that, that can inspire people and teach people for generations to come. And that is why we are preserving it so that we can carry it on to future generations. I love that uh, that thing in the in the Moog movie that starts the movie where it's the, it's the, it's Bob, uh, it's basically the birth of the synthesizer like on a phone answering machine tape. Uh, I can't remember, he was sending well, it to Herb Deutsch? Or? Yes, and actually that's one of the other mediums that we have in the archives are real to real tapes. We've just finished restoring 88 of them with a grant from the Grammy Foundation. And one of the tapes that's in the archives is an 84 minute tape that Bob included in with the first prototype that we just saw there when he sent it to Herb Deutsch, who was his collaborator at the time. And it's 84 minutes of Bob describing every single parameter and demoing the, the synth for Herb, because this is something brand new, you know. Trying to explain what it is. Exactly, <laughs> and it's fascinating. It's yeah. really, fa he, he describes in there, you know, some of his trials and tribulations, why he's making the choices he's making. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. That's cool stuff, very, very cool. So we really believe in, in uh, what these guys are doing, and so we've been brainstorming about how to uh, do a fundraiser because uh, you know the museum doesn't build itself, and uh, uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, this industry is a small industry. Most of the most of the companies here, uh, ours included, it's not not big companies, you know. And uh, I was telling the story yesterday of, of, I remember somebody told me, who works at Moog, that they were thinking about uh, when the 10,000s Mini Moog was coming out, they were going to do this huge thing because it, it was gigantic news for them. It was right at the end of the Mini Moog's life. And they said, gee, I wonder how many Mini Moog's people think that we've made. We should, maybe we should ask people. And then so they asked us, oh, it's probably 5 million Mini Moog's, 10 million maybe, because it's like everybody they see has one, right? Well, there's only 10,000 made, pretty much. 13,000 or something very you know very very small so uh, so all of this isn't necessarily like you know a gigantic money-making industry so but coming together you know we could do something cool together that would help uh, put this you know put this museum together and, and build this dream of inspiring the next generation yeah and I just like to add to that that the Bob Moog Foundation is a tiny 501c3 nonprofit organization we are not officially affiliated with Moog Music. We're our own thing, and we are donor-driven. We, we rely on people who have been touched and affected by Bob Moog's work and career to support our work and help us lift and carry this beautiful legacy to future generations so that people can continue to be inspired just like Eric and so many other people have been. Awesome. So what we're going to do is is we're going to... That's, yeah, absolutely. So what we're
we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to be in, announcing a contest on March fifteenth that is going to be very very cool. And we're offering we're going to we're, we're just going to give you a sneak peek today of the grand prize of that contest. We're not going to talk about any of the details. You got to come to the website on March fifteenth to find out the details. <laughs> But I wanted, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to show you what the grand prize is. And this has been something that I've been working on. Um, my, myself just, uh, myself and a friend creating this. And this is, uh, this is the grand prize. So I'm now going to show you what it is. And it is the OMG1. And uh, what this what this instrument is is uh, I got I got tired of, of people watching me play live with my laptop and asking me if I was checking my email and uh, you know what I was doing with playing around with my computer it's like no that's actually what I do that's actually my instrument so so this instrument is the whole idea of it is to combine all of the things that have happened and the things that are happening. So it's a, it's like a generation uh, joiner, morpher. So it's built around, uh, the center of it is, is a Moog Little Fatty. So it has a real analog synthesizer in it with control voltages and gates. Uh, it has a Mac Mini inside it. So right inside here is a uh, full-blown Mac Mini. So I can run any software, Mac or Windows even. Um, and uh, so, uh, obviously, I'm running Omnisphere, and I wanted to have a way to, to control Omnisphere. So I have two iPads built in the front. Um, so I've got this one showing what's happening on the Mac Mini. And this is our uh, OmniTR, our new OmniTR uh, iPad app that we're introducing here at the show. And a lot of the, the research that I did to develop the iPad app was around building this instrument. So uh, for myself, when I, when I play, so that, that it would be a good app for live performance. So, uh, and then we have, and, and then I thought, you know, three octaves, I, did, I found out that, that the uh, Little Fatty was a wonderful controller. I was originally going to uh, take the knobs off and just like mount the iPads on it. And then I said, well, before I do that, I should try the Little Fatty with Omnisphere. And I found out that it's like an incredible controller for Omnisphere, because when you're changing all the parameters and knobs, you can map those to all the, you know, the same labeled controls in Omnisphere, which I, which I did, and then we created a special thing in version 1.5 in OmniCR, so that when I change uh, sounds uh, in Omnisphere, the front panel of the Moog tracks, so it basically makes Omnisphere feel just like a hardware synth. So uh, you have the hands-on uh, knobs, you have the touch screens, and then I have two, two iPods here for additional um, uh, touch screens. And then I added a second keyboard because three octaves just wasn't really enough. So I used that to, to extend the range because I could play polyphonically on this. It's not a monophonic synth, it's a full, fully, poly fully polyphonic synth. So that's the concept of, of uh, the OMG. I want to stress this is not a commercial product. Right, you'll never be seeing this come out. This is a one of a kind. There's only one of one of these will ever. There will only be one OMG one. So, and uh, the winner of the contest is going to actually get this instrument. So, it's pretty cool. The uh, uh, the case is uh, made out of uh, beautiful uh, curly uh, maple, and uh, my friend uh, Daniel Aon created this beautiful craftsmanship. And um, yeah, it's just it's a, it's a, it's really something. So. Um, I'll, uh, I'll play a little bit of it for you so you can hear, hear what it does. And um, I'm just going to improvise something and you can get a little idea uh, of what it, what it does. I don't know what will happen here, but hopefully it will be something fun.
this was a while ago. He was like way ahead of his time, basically doing this. And I was like, this is incredible, you know. And, and then you had these interesting stories about what that was like at your house. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason that Bob was working with touch plates at that time is that he was developing a kind of experimental instrument, which is uh, commonly referred to as the multi-touch sensitive keyboard that he created for a, an experimental opera composer named John Eaton. And it's, uh, it was touch sensitive in five different ways, but it also had a touch pad on it. And uh, when when Eric talks about the, the touch plate, my personal childhood memories are of coming home from school and opening the door and the whole house smelling like chemicals because my father was baking touch plates in the oven. <laughs> I can smell I can smell them roasting right now <laughs> but uh, what what it really um, is remarkable about that is he, Bob was always interested in alternative control interfaces he was always searching for new ways uh, to give musicians um, more more creative freedom and more ways to express express their their the musical language so yeah and I um, think I think it's one of those things too is that we, we tend to put things in categories now you know people are arguing about analog synths versus digital synths, uh, hardware synths versus software synths, and uh, you know this versus that. It's look what look, look at what he said. You know, computers are the most important thing to happen to musicians since the invention of the cat cab, which was a long time ago. <laughs> and you know, that's that's from the, the analog guy. There's not another more analog guy. So that's what this is all about. It's putting it all together. Uh, it's it's about all of it and and, uh, and keeping the creativity going. So. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn this around so you guys can uh, have a uh, look at it and uh, you can ask questions and take pictures or whatever you like. And, and uh, so thank you guys very much. If I can just remind you guys to support the Bob Moe Foundation like Eric is. We are a donor-driven organization. Gary Yelton over here, if you can raise your hand, has some brochures and some pins from us. Please pick one of those up and consider supporting us. We cannot continue our work, and I mean that literally, without your support. All right. Thank you, Michelle. And I should also say a huge thank you to Eric. Um, this is a really amazing project. We're delighted to be part of it, and it's wonderful to see the Moog legacy alive in Eric Persing. Oh, thanks. All right, come on up and check it out. Pretty fun, huh? This is, this is kind of trippy, huh? So you can lift the lid. You can see on the inside, you can see the Mac Mini in there, and then all the... Oh, I had, to, I had to add a lot of different things to make the uh, pedals work because the, the uh, obviously the little fatty is designed as a monophonic synth, so it doesn't have things like a sustain pedal or a volume pedal or things like that. So there's a lot of uh, it's got all sorts of built-in fans. And you can see the workmanship on this is incredible. It's all using invisible hinges. There's uh, European uh, cabinetry, you know, special things for the. You sure you don't stuff. want to make some more? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, this is one of the things that's interesting about the synth is it's probably the only instrument in the world that has uh, analog control voltage gate, firewire, USB, uh, mini display port output, MIDI. Uh, it's got like pretty much every connector. You have a multi-pin connector. Oh, How long did you work on this for? Uh, we, I guess it was, it was about uh, five or six months, something like that. Originally I was doing it, it was just going to be a controller for Omnisphere. And then right around in the middle of the project, the, uh, the Mac Minis, the new Mac Minis came out. And they were fast enough to run Omnisphere. And so I thought, hey, I could, I could ma actually make a completely self-contained instrument with a computer inside. And, and, uh, yeah, they take this, take this to the gig, and you got the whole thing going. So. Yeah, the case. You got two iPads on there. This yeah, is the iPad. two iPads. Yeah, and then you have the two iPods also. So you have four, four touch services, and uh, yeah. So and they're all, they're all happening on the. Uh, oh, I didn't show that. You know, of course, you can run that to the other thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You could run any of the, uh, any of the iPad apps. And so, you know, being able to. Uh, 